Hi, I'm Mr. Most Days Off. You might remember me from such podcasts as the 50th Podcast Celebration Show and the Michael Price interview. I've brought a friend along today to talk to you about an exciting new product. Hi, everybody. Hi, Richie the Whiz Kid. Miles, did you know that most people have no idea how to get a Best Darn Diddly t-shirt? You can get a t-shirt with a podcast logo on it? Well, if you go to tpublic.com slash bestdarndiddly, you'll find not only shirts, but also Best Darn Diddly hoodies, posters, mugs, and even phone and laptop cases. It's like they'll put their name on anything. Help support the Best Darn Diddly Review Show by purchasing any of the crap we put our name on at tpublic.com slash bestdarndiddly. Bye, everybody! Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Most Days Off, and today we have got a high-speed episode for you. And joining me, as always, the Thelma to my Louise and your co-host with the most, Richie the Whiz Kid. How you doing today, Rich? Am I to understand correctly that there will be lamb served to us in this episode? <laughs> that is that is correct. Did you uh, put in your order? Awesome. Yes, yes. Yeah, if you didn't order, it won't be here. Son of a bitch. <laughs> well, I guess that's going to be a metaphor for how the day goes for us. Let's go ahead and get through this. I'll throw it back to you. The man. The myth. He had to change his name to Miguel Sanchez. It is Miles. <laughs> I love that bit at the end. I can't wait to get to that. But... We have a long ways to go before we get there. We are talking about the episode Marge on the Lamb. Not Lamb, Richie, but Lamb. Dope! <laughs> it originally aired on November 4th, 1993. And another sign that it's from season 5 because we once again had those shortened credits with no chalk gag and just straight to the couch gag where the Simpsons run through the wall. It turns out that the couch... Wasn't really a couch at all. It was just a backdrop with the couch pictured on it. So you can see all of the Simpsons-shaped holes through the wall. Well, that's depressing. I want them to have a couch. It's a beloved family member. Yeah, it's kind of an odd one, honestly, but it did make me laugh, and it was somewhat unexpected. <laughs> right off the bat, a couple things to talk about. First of all, Marge on the Lamb. I thought it was just a little bit interesting, so we'll get it out of the way now. The term on the lamb actually has a somewhat interesting history. It was created during the early 1900s, and it was an American slang that was specifically referring to a hasty departure when dealing with criminal activity. So right off the bat, it's a, a really clever title in a lot of ways. And of course, you can't talk about Marge on the Lamb without talking about the movie Thelma and Louise. Or I guess you could, but you would be skipping what? over a lot of very obvious uh, parody and homage. Thelma and Louise was released in 1991. It was actually a Ridley Scott movie, which I did not know until I re-watched it. That's right, the same person that made Alien, starring Sigourney Weaver, also made Thelma and Louise, starring Sigourney Weaver and Gina Davis. And I just gave this movie a rewatch, and I have to say, it was actually pretty entertaining. It's definitely not the best movie I've seen lately, but it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. Is there a scene where they're shooting cans and the farmer's getting mad that their 50-cent cans are gone? You, dude, come on. Spoiler alert. We haven't even gotten anywhere close to there yet. Yeah, that's, uh, that is another shot-for-shot shot parody from a movie. <laughs> And and is it another movie that also proves, like this episode, that women are terrible drivers <laughs> that don't pay attention? Has <laughs> just all women out there. <laughs> Dude, really? <laughs> That's like when someone says, "Like, oh, I'm not a racist," but and then no matter what they say next, you know, is going to be super. Don't super get racist. offended, but <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, no offense, or I don't mean any offense, but I'm about to say something super douchey. I think Ruth's issue is she's driving at nighttime. Well, it's daytime eventually, but she's always got those sunglasses on. Well, and honestly, though, is Ruth any worse than Wiggum in this episode? If anything, she's quite a bit better. Feminism. <laughs> 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 so let's go ahead and get into the episode where we're talking about 
This episode actually opens on a joke that didn't really do a whole lot for me, to be honest. It was a telethon where we see a very monotone guy reading from a book. For whatever reason, the crowd thinks this is hilarious, but the everyman, and myself included, like Homer Simpson, is just sitting there completely not understanding what is going on. What the hell's so funny? Well, it turns out that this is actually a dig at the comedian and author Garrison Keillor, who is a, I guess this was a parody of his style, and they said that they all actually are quite fond of the guy in real life, but this is a totally accurate dig at his expense. What was he, a Minnesota-based public radio and TV host, or TV show guy? So, like, if it's on, if you're on public radio like that, I mean, yeah, you're gonna have your moments like this, right? Yeah, I think it's most of them. <laughs> Stupid TV, be more funny. <laughs> Homer actually starts beating up the television. I, I think that was at Bart's suggestion, actually, which yeah. is always a bad idea. Doesn't he have, like, a card that helps him with that in this episode, too, <laughs> and he just immediately listened to him? We then see this terribly boring man pass it over to the much more preferable Troy McClure, who shows up to announce that public television needs your donations to keep programming such as Edward the Pentnet going. And we see this parody of a terrible, like, low-budget daytime drama show that you would see on a PBS-type station. This actually was really funny to me just because at any given time when I was a kid, if you turned on PBS and you didn't have something awesome like Lamb Chop on, you were very likely to get something like this. (laughs) Hi, I'm Troy McClure. You might remember me from such telethons as Out With Gout 88 and Let's Save Tony Orlando's Home. (laughs) <laughs> we actually, at this point, hear the phone start to ring. Troy McClure is startled. What the hell is that? <laughs> what the hell? Oh, oh we, we have a call. Got a call. <laughs> Homer's laughing, too, because as Troy McClure answers the phone, Homer's just like, ha, some idiot actually called in. Hello, what's your name? It's Marge Simpson. Ah! I'd like to pledge $30. <laughs> Homer is absolutely distraught at the idea that Marge would be supporting public TV. In fact, he's pretty mad about it, because after all, they never have anything good. But Marge points out that the public TV really needs the support, which is obviously true. And besides, they did give her two tickets to the ballet, which Homer, surprisingly, is really into. Well, did you see that she actually, like, more than doubled what they were already making? No, I missed it. <laughs> they were barely over $23, and she donated $30. So she put so them she over more the than top. doubled their total <laughs> amount. <laughs> oh, I missed that. That's both sad and funny, and probably true. <laughs> but yeah, the surprising part of the scene is Homer's actually really excited about getting the ballet tickets, and even Marge is like, Homer, you like ballet? <laughs> Marjorie, please. I enjoy all the meats of our cultural stew. <laughs> But then we see him start to dream about the ballet, and what, or what he thinks the ballet is, I should say. Wait, he wasn't right? That's not the ballet? He's sitting there in the front row of an auditorium, a very empty auditorium, actually, watching a bear driving around in a miniature car, and the bear's wearing a fez, just driving in circles. And Homer is, once again, like he does so often, making these joyous noises, just like gleeful noises of joy and the circus music plays. <laughs> the music is actually playing all the way up to the point where he's interrupted by the real-life doorbell ringing, and we see Ruth Powers, who we met last season in the episode New Kid on the Block, and she's back again this time to borrow a power sander. Marge asks Homer if they have a power sander, and Homer's like, nope. nope. But it pans out, and you can see he's actually resting his feet on one and using, I, I guess he's using it as like a leg massager. And the bad part is, though, the power sander is clearly like destroying the Simpsons carpet. Can we go back for a second and talk about the ballet thing? Because is that not like one of the like earliest memories you have of quoting the Simpsons among- amongst your friends? Because it was to me, like, I remember at school always talking about, like, and then Homer thought the ballet was the bear in the car, and he was, you'd run around singing that little tune all the time. I did, at least. When you first said quoting that scene, I was like, I don't really quote that scene, but I think about that little bear driving in circles a lot. <laughs> if that's what you mean. <laughs> I, I, I would go around going, do, 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 all the time. 
I would just make the joke if people ask me, like, are you paying attention? I'd be like, are we talking about a bear driving around in circles? <laughs> so I think we had the same idea, just just presented it in different ways. But I thought you were going to jump in there and back to the power sander. I thought you were going to jump at the Ned Flanders joke, which is fantastic because Homer first said they don't have one. But then when Marge points out there's one under the feet, he's like, OK, OK, you can borrow it. Just remember it's mine. And then it pans out and we see that there's a big sticker across it that says property of Ned Flanders. Yeah, clearly Flanders needs to come up with a different way to let people borrow things because all he does is put labels on all his stuff so that you know, like, at least half the stuff in the Simpsons household belongs to the Flanders. The problem with the name tag principle is it only works for honest people and Homer clearly has no issue keeping his shit. But I love I love the joke because it never gets old and there's no other way to really tell you that it belongs to the Flanders without having Ned go, hey, isn't that mine? Right. <laughs> and he's always so polite about it because that's the Flanders way to be. <laughs> Devil hiding around the corner. Unfortunately, the next morning at the breakfast table, unfortunately for Homer, I should say, his dreams are destroyed quite literally when Lisa is actually showing him a magazine that has ballet in it. That's what ballet is? Aww. (laughs) But Marge tells him that he cannot back out like that time he volunteered for an experiment to get out of dinner with Patty and Selma. Mr. Simpson, you do realize this may result in hair loss, giddiness, and the loss of equilibrium. Yeah, yeah, just give me the syrup. And that's when he (laughs) he had a full head of hair in that moment, too. (laughs) Yeah, his hair starts to fall out, he uh, starts to giggle, and then he, he falls over and... I actually like, he actually see him in the future giggling, saying, it was worth it, right before he falls over and starts <laughs> giggling out of control. <laughs> There's something contagious about that man's giddy laugh. There really is. It can't. I cannot help but smile when I hear it. I really can't. The next day at work, or I should say the next day after work, Homer's walking out with Lenny and Carl, and they invite him to go have a beer. Hey, Homer, you want to go get a beer on the way home? Oh, I can. I've got to take Marge to the ballet. <laughs> You're going to go see the bear in the little car, huh? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> I actually really love that, like, callback. That it was very quick, but it was so It's funny. a really quick one, but that little hmm by Homer is just so perfect. Like, I'm not the only one. Yeah, yeah. I, just, <laughs> I love the fact that it's just all the guys think that that's what ballet is. Unfortunately, though, again for Homer, a lot of just misfortune for him in this episode because he passes a crystal buzz cola machine and decides that he's got to have one but he pulls his pockets out to show he has absolutely no money so he's gonna have to do this another way he starts to reach his arm up the coke machine trying to reach up and score a free coke who hasn't tried that at least once after seeing this episode i totally tried this at least (laughs) once after seeing this episode (laughs) I got really excited the other day because I bought a Diet Dr. Pepper at a Coke machine outside of Walmart, and I got two at the same time, and I was overjoyed by this simple (laughs) little double delight. Double D. (laughs) That's it. You know those are my favorite. (laughs) I actually really like two, though, because Carl actually says, Careful, Homer. I heard someone lost an arm in there once. That's just an old wives' tale. But it shows inside the Coke machine and his arm is kind of snaking through and you see it pass a full skeletal arm and hand clutching onto a fresca. Well, that's the issue right there. You got to aim your sights higher than a fresca. No, the issue is you got to let go go of the the fucking can. That's the point. That's the whole point of this (laughs) this plot Nobody knows that's the issue yet. (laughs) It's already taken one man's arm is is the (laughs) great joke here. I forgot how many like moments that I really, really enjoy like thinking about The Simpsons are from this episode. This episode is interesting to me because I'll say this. When I first watched it, I really enjoyed it. The, the, when I say I first rewatched it, I should say, for this podcast, and I watched it just for fun last week, I really enjoyed it. But I will say this. Something that I found a little strange is while there are a lot of great moments The more I watched this, the less I enjoyed it. And it's not because it wasn't still funny. It was just that usually with these episodes, there's a lot of background information. So as I rewatch them multiple times, I get to think of different aspects that I learned from things like the commentary or, uh, you know, facts on the Internet or whatever. But 
there's really not a whole lot to this one. So in some ways I was disappointed, but I think it's only because we podcast about the show. If it wasn't for the podcast, this is a perfectly cromulent episode. <laughs> I see what you did there. But no, I just thought that was a, a really strange thing because I've really enjoyed the research process when I get to each episode, but this one just did not have much going for it in terms of behind the scenes information. Yeah, I got you on that, and it's and I'm not even gonna throw out the moniker that most people go with, where because it's a Marge episode. Because like you said, there's a lot of great episodes in it. For me, I feel like it's the back end of the episode, like the final act. There's not a whole lot to it, but at the same time, it's the most exciting sequence in in like terms of the action happening. But I think you're totally right as a viewer of a cartoon. Watching this car chase, it's really a lot of pretty set animation. You see a lot of wide shots with all of the police cars chasing her and or chasing them, I should say. And it it really limits what the characters can do, even though the situation they're in is is really exciting. Well put. Well struck, sir. Well struck. <laughs> For now, we've got a ways to go before we get to that final car chase. We should probably keep talking about the show in order. Homer actually manages to reach this Coke can through the machine, but he immediately realizes he's stuck. He asks Lenny and Carl for help, but they just scream and are like, he's done for, let's get out of here, which is incredibly douchey friends, by the way. Like, what the fuck, guys? That's wrong. But it's funny because we've had episodes where something happens to Bart, and like Milhouse and everybody else will run away. Oh, he's done for a run. And like, has they the act just like kids do. Yeah, yeah. It's like, we don't want to get in trouble with Mr. Burns or trying to steal Cokes. Well, and because if they were there and they actually helped him, he, it would have been like a 10 minute ordeal and he would have made it to the ballet. That's also true. It's important for the plot line of this episode <laughs> that no one helps. That Homer out. stays stuck. A very good point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Homer's stuck to the point where he actually starts dragging the Coke machine around, which in some ways is sweet, because as he's grunting and struggling, he's saying, like, I must get to Marge, have to get her to the ballet. So at this point, at least, he's still got his mind on the goal, though we're going to find out the simple solution that could fix this whole See, thing soon, and it's going to make it much, much worse. <laughs> I, I feel like that you say it's sweet. I think it's just him, like fighting himself more so or less because again we know what's going to happen here in a second but i think he's like saying it out loud so it's like well if anybody heard me or saw me i was i was trying to get to my wife i could see that argument i guess i, I do enjoy what he calls out and, and this would could be to either side of our points but depending on homer's intent here i love how he's calling out for for help and he actually declares at one point help please snack related mishap <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately again yet another thing that got in homer's way that he clearly is not going to have the willpower to skip all this dragging of the coke machine around has made him hungry so when he passes the candy machine and still has no money he gets a very similar idea to the one that he had before and he ends up with very similar results so now we have homer stuck between Two vending machines, a Coke machine and a candy machine. Ooh, candy. <laughs> Back at home, we actually see Marge in an unusually annoyed manner. Usually Marge is relatively used to Homer shenanigans, but here you can see she's getting really frustrated. She was clearly excited about going to this ballet, and when the phone rings and she answers it, Homer explains that he's in a bit of a predicament. Sure, Homer. Trapped in the vending machines. Okay. <laughs> Marge clearly doesn't believe him, and she's clearly upset with him, and she's very clearly disappointed. I, I Honestly, I think she does believe him. I absolutely think she believes him, but it's like, oh, so convenient that something you, you care nothing about, like, you find a way to not have to do it. You know, I, I think you're right. I think that she believes that it's actually happened, but she's still frustrated because if it were something that he were excited about, he'd probably be a lot more willing to just let go of the can at this point. Or that is what he's more excited about, so I don't know. But either way, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true, true. Uh, I do like this little line here, though. Marge is like, well, I got these ballet tickets here, so she tries to give them away to Patty and Selma. And Patty and Selma just say, Ugh, no, that's girl stuff. <laughs> <laughs> little clue into their psyche, I think, just in that brief moment. 
And just at that moment, the doorbell rings again, and Ruth shows up to return that power Hello. sander. My name is Elder Grant. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she comments that when her husband left, he took all the power tools along with her car, her youth, and her faith in mankind. <laughs> Sounds like a divorcee to me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when Marge gets the idea to invite Ruth to the ballet so they can go and have a girls' night. Uh, all of the nice places in town to have it, they're at Springfield Elementary School's gymnasium, where tonight is the ballet. Tomorrow, they're closed to fix that gas leak. That's so awful. <laughs> <laughs> it makes oh, sense that's... to why everybody's so entertained by this shitty ballet. <laughs> <laughs> I just I keep thinking of all the ramifications of what they're inhaling while the ballet is going on. <laughs> I mean, homeboy's loins can only be entertaining for so far, for so <laughs> long. I don't care who you are. <laughs> Did you say long? <laughs> Most of the people at the ballet at the Springfield Elementary School gymnasium are sitting in the bleachers, as you might expect. But there's one set of guests that have a special box seat that I guess was built just for them, once again, at the school gymnasium. And that's Mr. Burns and Smithers, who are there to enjoy an evening of ballet. Far too much dancing and not nearly enough prancing. A little mincing would be nice. <laughs> I do really like, too, the finale makes me laugh, uh, the finale of the actual ballet. The male tosses the female up into the air, and she comes down and grabs onto the rim, breaking the glass, the rim of the basketball <laughs> goal, I should say, because, again, we're in the school gymnasium. And as she essentially does a slam dunk motion, she breaks the glass of the backboard, much like Shaquille O'Neal used to do in the early 90s, or maybe that was late 90s. At some point in the 90s, it was a big damn deal because Shaquille O'Neal would break break backboards all the damn time to the point where the NBA actually had to redesign the backboard mostly because of him. Well, he's a giant guy, so yeah, after he does it the first time, you're like, oh, that was something that might not ever happen again. And then when it happens like three more times, you're like, okay, stop. Scientist, we need some some sports scientists now, please. But if ballet had that in it, I would want to go see it all the time. Oh yeah, totally. It was a it was a big deal, and it gets a standing ovation as it should. I actually like they just take a bow under the uh, or amongst the broken glass. <laughs> yeah, I don't think ballet shoes are that like protective of your feet. <laughs> no, no, they sure are not. <laughs> At least Marge and Ruth definitely have a good time. I think everybody had a good time, but for sure Marge and Ruth had a fantastic time. And Ruth is not ready to call it a night yet. You're not going home already, are you? Well, yeah, it's almost 9.30. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we better turn in. <laughs> oh, you're serious. <laughs> <laughs> good old Marge. That's actually, I, I really like that, and they're going to do another call back to that joke again around the corner. This is a, a really well-constructed episode. They do a lot with what they have. And again, the parody when they do it, which isn't the entire episode like it was with Cape Fear, but there's a lot of parody that we're going to be getting into very, very soon. This seems to be the, the stride that the Simpsons are in right now, where that seems to be their go-to episode arc in a lot of ways. You know, we've been talking about... This episode, and this is very much a Ruth episode because you're finally getting to see Ruth Powers, but I don't think we've talked about Pamela Reed at all. Uh, no, we haven't. And really, this is only her second. I mean, she's actually been in more than the two episodes, but in terms of really having any dialogue or, or probably her being a part of it at all, this is really only her second episode. The commentary did actually talk quite a bit about Pamela Reed. I did not get a lot from the director's commentary on this episode. As I already mentioned earlier, there just wasn't a lot going on, it seems, with this show. It was just a, a fairly standard episode in a lot of ways in terms of the production. But one thing they did talk about was how amazing Pamela Reed was. And they actually all agreed, everybody that was on that commentary, including Matt Groening, David Merkin, Mark Kirkland and David Silverman all agreed that it's an absolute shame that they did not use that character more, and they should really do so because she is such a treat to work with. She really embodies the character of Ruth and actually 
most of her lines are written, but a lot of her mannerisms are actually improv by Pamela Reed. So some of the groans and the facial expressions that Ruth makes are actually done by Pamela in the studio. Uh, I'll point some of those out as we go along. You can totally see that. And for those of you who are just blanking right now on Pamela Reed, if you remember, like, obviously for me and Miles, probably our favorite role of hers was in Kindergarten Cop because she was Arnold Schwarzenegger's partner. I didn't even realize that was her, but that's a fucking amazing. I, yeah, like you I can see it now. Movie. Like when you, yeah, totally. when, you hear, when you hear Ruth and you talk about those mannerisms, think about how she was in that movie. Oh, dude, that's fantastic. Now I want to go watch that. Movie. <laughs> We're going on the Thursday Throwdown podcast with Patsy the Angry Nerd. I'm going to have to cancel on him so I can watch Kindergarten Cop. <laughs> Get to the chopper, <laughs> you sissy boy. <laughs> So we actually get back to Homer at this point. Marge and, and Ruth have had a great night. Homer is not having such a great night. He's still stuck in the vending machines, and there's now a crew of people working, trying to get him free. Homer gets so upset, he actually declares, I'm going to have these things on my arms forever. And that triggers a flash forward or a, a fantasy sequence where Homer starts envisioning Maggie's wedding day. Uh, I love that Maggie still has her pacifier. Uh, she only removes it so she can kiss her new husband. Well, how else are you going to know that it's Maggie? That's true. It's, it would not really, we wouldn't have a clue, actually. We might assume it's Lisa. Exactly. But Homer's on the stage or up wherever they are up next to the couple being wed, and he's still got these vending machines attached to him, but he announces that he's so happy there's going to be free candy and sodas for all, and starts firing Cokes and snacks into the audience. Hmm, mm, convenient. convenient. <laughs> but think about it this way, all the stuff's coming out of the machines, but his hands still aren't. <laughs> we get a very grim scene next, however, when we see the technician talking to Homer, and he leans down and says, you know, Homer, this is never easy to say. I'm going to have to saw your arms off. They'll grow back, right? Uh, yeah. And he fires up the power saw. <laughs> Homer, are you still holding on to the can? Your point being? <laughs> <laughs> you know, aren't, weren't they laughing at him? Like, in the, like you see Homer, but in the background, you see the building. And can't you hear them in the building still? Homer's walking out clearly ashamed. And yes, there is a ton of laughter echoing behind him. Dude, I would be pissed if I was one of one of the fire department people or the technicians. Because, like, you've been there for hours and, like, you're missing dinner, you're missing your family, you're missing whatever you're going to go do. Or missing maybe saving a lumber yard that was burning by <laughs> nearby, as we're going to find out shortly. Yeah. I also or missing the playing. ballet. <laughs> yeah. What if they also had date nights <laughs> planned? How, how unthoughtful. Homer not only ruined his date, <laughs> but he ruined, like, all of their dates as well. It's a super fucked up event. So I'm I'm kind of happy that they were laughing and enjoying themselves, at least. True. And honestly, I think it's a good thing that Marge didn't call it a night at 930, and her and Ruth went out to Jittery Joe's Coffee Shop for a late night cup of coffee. And I really love the neon sign on the outside of uh, Jittery Joe's because it was actually jittering, and it was really, <laughs> really well done. Ruth is talking to Marge about her relationship, and she says to Marge, I envy you and Homer. Thank you. Why? <laughs> if you ever met my ex-husband, you'd understand. All he ever did was eat, sleep, and drink beer. Your point being? <laughs> and to top it off, he's been stiffing me on child support for the last four months. Well, you are unlucky, but there are a lot of good men out there. <clears throat> and we see Barney show up with a big burp and he says, Hey, can I throw up in your bathroom? I'll buy something. <laughs> that's actually that shutters that ruth does right there is one of those ad lib moments i was talking about uh a great great bit of acting in the voice box basically or in the recording studio i should say but barney is always there to represent the single men of springfield and he as usual is quite disappointing to the opposite woman or the opposite sex or really probably all of the sexes in this sexes. case <laughs> yeah I'm going to say, though, I, Barney is always the one picture whenever there's a moment where it's like, well, there's lots of single men in Springfield, but Marge is always the one pointing that out. So I feel like Marge is trying to help Homer's, quote unquote, best friend out, maybe? 
Well, I mean, that makes sense. I know that that's something that, you know, would commonly happen in real life. To some extent, you'd want to set up a single friend with somebody that you think they'd be into. I will say Selma, or but I'm, I think it was Patty, excuse me. Patty, I think a little bit more in Barney's League than Ruth is, because that's quite an upgrade in terms of just because of how awful Patty and Selma are. <laughs> <laughs> well, until you find out what Ruth likes to do in her spare time. That's true. I don't know, though. I, that's my type of crazy. I it's the crazy hot scale, right? Yeah, it's the crazy hot scale, and she's <laughs> north of it, buddy. <laughs> so, back at the Simpsons' home, Homer's actually pacing next to the door. He seems like he's deep in thought, and it's clearly pretty late at this point. Marge arrives home, and Homer's immediately like, I know you didn't believe me about the vending machines. That's why I had the fireman write a note for me. Dear Mrs. Simpson, while we were rescuing your husband, a lumber yard burned down. No! Oh, lumber has a million uses. <laughs> like, he didn't even read the letter before he gave it to her, which is kind of sweet. <laughs> <laughs> he was being honest, yay. <laughs> but but at the same time, I think it's like he was just, what he wanted was an excuse for why this happened, where he's not to blame, so he didn't care about actually reading the letter, because he was like, oh, I'm, I'm in the clear because they wrote me this doctor's note, basically. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> But Marge ends up explaining that while she's a little bit disappointed in Homer, she ended up having a really good time with Ruth. In fact, they're going to go out again tomorrow night. That's twice. Marge, I think you're spending entirely too much time with this woman. <laughs> Homer freaks out in classic childlike Homer style. <laughs> but Marge insists and points out, you know, it's difficult for me to make friends, Homer, which leads to a flashback sequence where Marge was entertaining a group of women and Everything seemed to be going really, really well. In fact, I think one of the women even says, Oh, Marge, we should do this every Thursday. <laughs> and that's when Homer crashes into the living room wearing a shirt that says no fat chicks and holding a skunk. <laughs> <laughs> Marge, I got sprayed by the skunk. <laughs> oh, look, it's doing it again. <laughs> and all the women just scream and run out of the house. Which I don't know if that plays into the Homer being unbreakable thing, but... I've been sprayed by a skunk once, and there's no way you pick the skunk up and then let it spray you a second time. Like as soon as as soon as you're sprayed the first time, you're done. It's so god awful. Like oh oh oh, <laughs> I can't even imagine, dude. <laughs> but I'm super guilty now. When I'm on like road trips or we smell a skunk on the highway, I always think it's something else first. <laughs> oh damn, just a skunk. <laughs> But Homer is actually pretty legitimately upset by this whole thing. He really doesn't want Marge to go out. After all, it's Saturday night. That's their special night. What's so special about it? Oh, I don't know. A little show called Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. <laughs> <laughs> and Homer has some great animation here because he's kind of pouting and he has his arm crossed. He's being really, really petty and silly about this whole thing. And, and clearly... This is a good thing for Marge. <laughs> and to Marge's credit, despite Homer's protest, she's still getting ready the next night to go out. She's putting on her makeup and Homer's just sitting in the background asking her a string of questions. Where are you going? I don't know. When will you be back? I don't know. Where are you going? You already asked me that. Will you bring me back something? And Homer's being just very, very childlike, which I think is actually really funny and and plays great against the next sequence, because just then we hear a horn honk outside, and Marge gives Homer a kiss as she says, I gotta go, and heads out to meet up with Ruth. And Ruth is waiting outside in a shiny blue convertible, just like the one they used in Thelma and Louise, and I think this is really the first true reference to that movie. You have that feel earlier. You have the feel for it, and there is definitely some stuff with the husband being neglectful, but in the movie, it was much, much more extreme than Homer just being a bit of a buffoon. He was, the, the husband was a real prick in the movie, versus Homer, as we know, is just more, like I said, a buffoon than he is an asshole. But regardless, this, at this point, when you see this car pull up, you know for certain what is happening. This is a Thelma and Louise parody at this point. Absolutely. No question about it. Yeah, and what I, what I was talking about with playing it against the next scene is actually Homer tries to guilt Marge for turning the, her back on the children, but while Homer is acting like a total child, the the kids are being totally cool about the whole thing and can actually are 
are seemingly happy for their mom. Rock the Casbah! Yeah. <laughs> Bart shouts out, and uh, Lisa's also just like, have a great time. <laughs> like, everything's going to be completely okay, and this is all about Homer, of course. Everything always is, and Ruth is actually dressed with a little edge. She's smoking cigarettes, and Marge says, you know, you uh, look nice. Tonight's not about nice. Tonight's about... Sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. Oh, sorry, Marge, wrong tape. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the jungle! jungle! We, we got, got fun, fun and games. games! We got everything you want, honey! We know all the names! <laughs> <laughs> and they do another clever callback to that later in the episode. Too. <laughs> I love that part. And, and that's when we see Ruth speed off down Evergreen Terrace. The show fades to black here, and the Simpsons clearly take a commercial break, so why don't we do the same, and we're going to hear from some friends and sponsors. Aw, but I don't wanna. Hey, this is The Toe, host of the Gravity Beard Podcast, a variety show with interviews and discussions on a wide range of topics. Our guests have included a viral YouTube star, a former child actor, we've even had a guy on who may have solved the D.B. Cooper case. It's a delicious box of audio chocolate. You never know what you'll get. Find it on Podbean, iTunes, and other places you listen to podcasts. It's the Gravity Beard Podcast. It's what your ears will want to be listening to. Hey guys, it's Richie the Whiz Kid here from the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. And I'm here to talk to you about PopThreads.com, your number one source for finding awesome nerdy t-shirts. Are you sick from not knowing what to wear when you go out with all your friends on the weekends? Well, don't have a cow, man. Go to popthreads.com, and if you use the code SIMPSONS at checkout, you can save 15% on all your t-shirt needs. When we get back to the show, we're in the Simpsons living room where we see Homer is venting to the kids. He's mad that Marge went out to have fun without him. But Bart's like, don't worry, you'll feel better after we put your hair in curlers and give you a makeover, Homina. Ooh, that would be delightful. Quiet, boy. There's nothing to be ashamed of here. Women have a right to a night out. Right, Lisa? Sure, Dad. Whoosh! Homer's had enough of being made fun of by his own children, so he decides he's going to call his buddies. Because after all, Marge isn't the only one that can have a girl's night out. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is my favorite part of the episode, too. I love this whole sequence where Homer's trying to arrange a quote-unquote girl's night out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a contender. I think there's one part that beats this out just slightly for me, but this one is hilarious. All, all of this is hilarious. Uh, there's three sequences here. The first one, we see Homer calls Lenny, but Lenny has to pass because he's going to be watching the game. <laughs> but when it pans out, we see he's actually shaving his wife's legs. Yeah, I assumed it was his mother. Uh, they did confirm in the, the commentary that it was intended to be his wife. I thought it was wife, thought maybe mother, but that's more of a Skinner thing than a Lenny thing in my mind. I just don't remember Lenny being married except for like once or twice where he like j pretends to be married, so. Well, either way, the woman whose legs he is shaving is just berating him, telling him he's doing a, a terrible job. Shave up, not down. Well, duh, everyone knows that. <laughs> The best one, though, or I don't know, it's hard. See, it's even hard to say that. They're all the best one. It's like ranking the season's episodes. But the second one is he calls Mr. Burns, who we see is in a pink bathrobe and slippers, laying on a pink rug with a candy shaped box of chocolates, a pink phone, and he's it's even one of those. I'm sorry, he's got a record player and a pink phone. And he's even kind of twirling. It's an old school <laughs> wired phone. So he's like twirling the, the cord essentially around his finger, much like you would see a teenage girl do in an 80s movie. Oh, sounds delish. Let me just toss some jeans on and I'll wait a minute. Who is this? <laughs> and that's the part that I love about that moment is that like Homer's trying to call his buddies to have a night out, but like he can't find anybody. So he calls Mr. Burns. I, I just how quickly did he that. get to that? He went from Lenny to yeah. Burns, like Barney, well, he Carl, there any of the bar. Flies? He might have he might have called some of the other guys, and this is before cell phone usage. So True. it's all it's all the numbers you know, which would be your coworkers, your boss, and then your own home. And but we do like, know he, that he's going to get to Moe's later, so that they probably didn't exactly. want to call that. Totally, I I, I can see that. Uh, I also really like this last one, though. It also <laughs> might be my favorite because. <laughs> 
Homer calls Flanders, of all people. Howdly doodly do. And then, like, Homer immediately hangs up as soon as he, as soon as Flanders answers, he hangs up. Hello? He's gonna dial tone and, ho- yeah, but Flanders still Hello? trying to be friendly. <laughs> Hello, doodly <odly-odly. laughs> Hello, doodly Hello, is probably my new, new way to answer the phone. <laughs> Homer decides that he just doesn't need friends. He can go and have a good time all on his own. But Lisa reminds him that it is against the law, state and federal, to leave the kids without a babysitter. Oh, Lisa, haven't you seen Home Alone? If some burglars come in, it'll be a very humorous and entertaining situation. (laughs) And I love this, too, because Bart agrees wholeheartedly. You're right, Homer. We don't need a babysitter. Which immediately makes Homer <laughs> suspicious. Fortunately, however, this is one of the only fortunate things that happens to Homer in the whole episode because he has faced this situation before, it seems. He's made himself a card that he keeps in his shirt pocket that says, always do the opposite of what Bart says. To be fair, he did not make this card. There is no way that Homer had the foresight to make this card. I, I think this is Marge, a Marge thing. Marge, you're right. Yeah, totally. But either way... He at least has the foresight to consult the card before making any major decisions. <laughs> Blast that infernal card. Wait, don't give that card to me. All right, here you go. Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Homer just has the exact right amount of intelligence to realize that he's being duped with the opposite game by Bart. And that whole sequence, like, I put the phone calls in with that sequence because definitely, like, you can't be the best part of the episode without having the card part in there as well. And again, it's with Dan and the delivery of such little wording and the way he does it, which we've been talking about for weeks now, is just getting better and better with with the experience. And we're in the fifth season now, but, like, the little moment where Bart's like, blast that infernal card. And he goes, wait, don't give me that card. And literally Homer goes, here you go. No! And like the whole little way he does that moment is so funny. And it's it's literally two seconds maybe. But like it makes it so, so much perfect. better. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's, it's all about that delivery. And maybe one of the only people that is able to deliver a line with the same amount of perfectness that dan castlanetta does is phil hartman and i love that we get this lionel hutt sequence next because this was one of those contenders for my favorite part of the episode as well it's so so great here mr simpson i was going through your garbage and i couldn't help but overhear that you needed a babysitter of course being a highly skilled attorney my fee is 175 dollars per hour we pay $8 for the night, and you can take two popsicles out of the freezer. Three. Two. Okay, two. And I get to keep this old birdcage. Done. <laughs> Still got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this this whole, the birdcage is just the great little bit at the end, and just the fact, I couldn't help from about hearing about your babysitter woes because I was picking through your garbage. <laughs> <laughs> The Simpsons get a lot of colorful characters outside in their front yard. <laughs> That's true. Next up, though, we're back with Marge and Ruth, and they pull up to a bar. It's got a letter missing out of the sign. It's S H something T K I C K E R. Ooh, I've heard a lot about <laughs> shot kickers. It is, in fact, a very country bar, but despite that, everyone still seems to be having a good time. Uh, there, everyone's dancing. Marge and Ruth are on the dance floor. They're just doing like a line dance, and uh, Willie's actually riding a mechanical bull. How come no one else's chair is doing this? <laughs> that, uh, great line there too. <laughs> a couple of guys come up and hit on Marge, but Marge turns them down. And this is absolute parody. This is straight out probably the, the pivotal scene in Thelma and Louise that gets their whole plot started where they're in the bar and they get hit on by some guys. But then, of course, things start going poorly when they get a little rapey. Uh, and in this episode, though, it was great the way they handled that, because in the movie, it actually gets quite dark. It's a very intense scene. It's very graphic and, and uh, relatively violent as well. And uh, it gets it gets very intense, I'll say. But this uh, this parody is so well done because when Marge turns them down originally, 
The guy's like, listen, honey, I always get what I want. I said no. Oh, oh, did you? Oh, I'm so sorry. I completely misunderstood. Please accept our apologies. <laughs> and again, it went the exact opposite of the way it went in the movie, which was, was fantastic. Uh, another little fun fact from the commentary here, the quiet cowboy, the second guy that was standing behind the one that was talking, was drawn to look like David Merkin, the showrunner for this season of the show. <laughs> well, what does that say about him as a person? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, as he pointed out, it showed that he was balding around the time that this episode was created. <laughs> <laughs> it's I've only seen bits and pieces of Thelma and Louise because, like, it used to come on, you know, in the afternoon on, like, a Saturday when you're turning your TV on. And unfortunately, uh, the scene outside when the cowboy takes her outside, like, I it just happened to be on one day. And I turned it on and I was like, this is Thelma and Louise? But it was on, like, TNT or something like that, so it was edited. And then I saw when the other one came out there and, like, Shot the guy, or isn't that what happens? Well, let's just say right now, first, just in case you haven't seen the 1991 Ridley Scott film, there are spoilers ahead and a few that we already crossed through. But yeah, <laughs> uh, this, the underlying, I guess, driving force behind Thelma and Louise is actually a rape. Uh, one character was raped younger in life, and then when she sees the other character in the process of being raped, she essentially takes it on herself to defend her, which is great, uh, but then after the scene has been dissolved, the guy just gets really mouthy, and she decides to shoot him in the chest, because she's just more or less had enough. Uh, very much the Ruth character in this, in this parody. And that sets up a sequence where these two women are now on the run from the law, uh, in one of their husband's vehicles, and it just escalates from there. It's a, it's a, actually, like I said, it's a pretty, pretty good film. And just another little fun fact about that movie, since we're talking about it, it was actually Brad Pitt's first ever movie. Yep. He doesn't have a huge role, but uh, his role is pivotal to the plot, and he is pretty good in the film, seeing as that this is his first movie. Gotta start somewhere. Yeah, and then I think working with people like Gina Davis and Sigourney Weaver is a, a pretty good place to be, because that's where all of his scenes take place with. Yeah, not a bad group of people to be around when you're getting up and coming. Exactly. So, back to this episode, Homer decides he needs to go where everyone knows his name, which is, of course, Moe's, but I love he walks in and says, hey, everyone, and just no one moves, they're all just completely stuck in their beers not even paying attention very depressing scene it's kind of dark here and homer is actually wanting to make a night of it he's looking to get cheered up he says mo give me the darts no we're phasing out the games because people drink less when they're having fun <laughs> which is I completely don't know if that's actually true yeah that's, I, uh... that's false man like i drink so much more like if i'm playing golden tea you're like oh crap I've, I've had like four beers in the last hour when i used to only do one an hour you're like yeah it's <laughs> well, for your golden tea example, you realize as soon as you let go of the arcade cabinet that things are a little bit wobbly. <laughs> but your drives are fucking on point. That's how that shit works. Yep. It's like darts or pool or any other other game like that. There's the, the perfect number of beers, which is somewhere between three and four that makes you a god. And then everything beyond that, you start going downhill. About three quarters of the way through your second beer, you start feeling comfortable where you're like, oh man, I'm doing all right. And then by... The next full beer, you're like, oh, man, I think I can actually beat everybody at this game. And then the one after that, you're like, I am beating everybody at this game, whether you are or not. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's how it works. <laughs> Back at the Simpsons home, we actually see that the kids are watching L.A. Law with Lionel Hutz. And Lionel Hutz is just ripping the shit out of it. Oh, sure. Like lawyers work in big buildings and have secretaries. Look at him. He's wearing a belt. That's Hollywood for you. <laughs> Poor lawyer. Again, back with Marge, Ruth is taking her out to a new experience. She's never been to an underground club before, and this one is called the Hate Box. Inside, she's dancing, and there's this great sequence where a punk rock chick with like a purple mohawk comes up to Marge and says, Don't you think your hair is a bit much? <laughs> I also love Otto here. Hey, Mrs. Simpson, you can try one of these smart drinks. Nope. Oh, wow, I'm wasting my life. <laughs> <laughs> they work. 
<laughs> and then finally she sees Mayor Quimby approach and he actually asked her to dance. But Mayor Quimby's covered in body paint. And when asked what he's doing, he claims to be there with his nephews. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> My guidebook, The Simpsons, a complete guide to our favorite family, mentions that this little moment with Mayor Quimby is supposed to be a riff on or a reference to this big deal with Teddy Kennedy and William Kennedy Smith. When the, there was like an alleged rape incident basically once. Oh, Jesus, so, that's dark. So <laughs> I think that like he's here with his nephews and his ne- nephews are gone somewhere else doing something inappropriate. Like apparently that was a reference to that. That would totally be appropriate to both Dave Merkin and to Thelma and Louise in terms of that as a theme. So interesting. I did not I did not read anything about that, but that's a fun fact or a grim fact, actually. But the more, you know, yeah. <laughs> Homer's still having a rough time on his own, though. He actually gets kicked out of the Quickie Mart for reading the magazines without paying. This is not a library. (laughs) And then we see him at the library, but he gets kicked out for eating a hot dog and having a Coke. This is not a Quickie Mart. (laughs) Meanwhile, Ruth and Marge are off to the country because Ruth has something to show Marge, and she actually has a gun. Oh. (laughs) Ruth teaches Marge to shoot, and they start shooting at some tin cans, but then this old man in red pajamas comes out yelling, Me cans! Me precious antique cans! Oh, look at what you've done to them! <laughs> I went a little more Irish than he was in the show. I don't know why. It just <laughs> happened that way. But this was me actually cans, a nod. Me precious antique cans! <laughs> this was actually a joke about Walter Brennan, who I did not know, so I had to look up, but... He was an American actor. He actually won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 1936, 1938, and 1940, making him one of only three male actors to win three Oscars. Wow. The more you know. But yeah, in that moment, he was basically like gold prospector speech, basically. (laughs) Not Irish. Yeah, again, it just happens sometimes. Voices (laughs) are weird. Voices are tough, man. They can be a challenge. But for now, we actually get another great role reversal, which there's a bunch of those in this episode that are just fantastic. This time, it's Ruth saying that it's getting late, but Marge saying, it's only midnight. I know a place. And they drive up to the giant Springfield sign in in the hills, much like the Hollywood sign. Marge says this is where her and Homer used to go on dates, and we actually see a flashback of one where Marge is standing next to Homer as he beats the crap out of a box, and Homer's... Uh, it's the and, weather station. <laughs> yeah, and Marge has to say, Homer, stop. It's just a weather station. Come on, Marge. It's fun to smash things. <laughs> I smashed it good. <laughs> you got real pretty hair. <laughs> you went really, really creepy on the hair part there, but... So did Homer! <laughs> he didn't go that creepy. He did go a little bit off, though. It was a very just out of place thing to say after getting so giddy about beating up a weather station (laughs) but ruth and marge are actually really having a nice time they're enjoying the solitude and the view and they can actually see their houses from the hillside and that's when marge notices there's a lot of black smoke coming out of her chimney and they decide they should call it a night Well, and I love this moment, too, because after Marge says that, it actually cuts into the Simpsons' house, <laughs> and you see Lionel Hutz burning everything he owns, and Lisa even asks him, like, Lionel Hutz, why are you burning all your stuff? And he goes, there's no more Lionel Hutz. From now on, I am Miguel Sanchez. <laughs> I wonder when he becomes Dr. Falk. <laughs> <laughs> Only when necessary. Yeah. For now, though... Homer and Marge actually just miss each other because as Marge and Ruth leave the hillside, Homer decides that he's going to go visit. I guess he's just feeling nostalgic as well and looking for for somewhere to pass the time. I honestly really like that they did that, though, because it's kind of sweet when you think about it, because like Homer is being selfish like he always is, but he really misses Marge. And so like Marge took Ruth up to their spot and now Homer's going up to their spot. So it's actually like. I mean, obviously they do this on purpose too, but it's it's a very sweet little moment if you think about it. No, I do. I, I agree with you entirely, and I I like that a lot that they both end up going to a spot that's meaningful to them because of the meaning of their relationship in each other is what it really all comes down to. 
And again, throughout this episode, I don't know that we've done a good enough job of pointing out the fact that Ruth is keep constantly saying to Marge how lucky she is to have a man like Homer. And while every time she makes comparisons, it sounds like her ex is very similar to Homer. Uh, basically, throughout it, Marge is frustrated with Homer. But of course, we're getting to a point where she too will realize just how lucky she is. Because at the end of the day, again, I've already said it once. Homer might be a complete and utter just nincompoop, but he is not an asshole. He is a good guy. And he's smarter than a dog. (laughs) That he is always at least as smart as a dog. (laughs) Once up at the hillside, though, there's another great sequence here. First of all, there's a new weather station, and at first Homer gets really (laughs) excited, but then he realizes without Marge, it's, it's just not the same. But then we actually see Wiggum coming out of the tree line with a bottle, clearly a liquor bottle. And he says, oh, nothing like moonshine from your own still. Oh, Simpson, what are you doing here? And he tosses the bottle aside and it explodes. That's how potent <laughs> Wiggum's moonshine is. I do like the moment where Homer first sees the new weather station and he goes, I'll bash it good. And then he like, raises it up he's like, oh. Just that instinct just kicked in, man. <laughs> and Homer's very upset. In fact, Wiggum tries to console Homer. He recommends getting one of those inflatable women. Just make sure it's a woman, though. Because uh, one time I, uh, 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 come on, I'll give you a ride. Yeah, what a dark joke, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what is an inflate? Like, is it like an inflatable dude with a, like, dildo strap to it? I guess I need to go to the sex shop and see what's up. I assume it has an inflatable <laughs> cock. I don't know. Can how would that even work, actually? I don't know. All right, let us know. Is it inflatable or is it attached? Like, yeah, I, I honestly never realized there were male inflatable sex toys. Please seen, send pictures to insert Miles' address yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, please don't send pictures. No, I've please send inflatable that. dolls to insert Miles' address here. <laughs> yeah, those will take. <laughs> I'm sure we can make something funny with that. <laughs> But while Wiggum is giving Homer a ride home, he notices the car in front of them is a little bit suspicious. One of the taillights is slightly smaller than the other. He's going to have to pull them over. I can actually say I got pulled over once coming home, going from Denton to Fort Worth. It's about a 30 minute drive and it was around two in the morning and I actually had not been drinking this night, but it's after somebody had hit the front end of my car and screwed up half of my entire front end. And the cop told me when he pulled me over, I immediately asked him, officer, can I ask you why you pulled me over? And he said, because your lights are pointing at more than 45 degrees difference on the front end of your car. And when I said, well, sir, I've had this looked at and it's going to cost $4,000 to repair and nothing's hanging off of the car. Do you have $4,000 I could borrow? I was pissed. It's one of only two times I ever yelled at a police officer and I do not recommend doing it. But the cop did that thing where he puts his ear up to his shoulder on his radio and he's like, oh, I have another call coming in, sir. Have a good night. And after he left, I was like, oh, shit, I could have gotten in trouble. (laughs) So sometimes you do hear about little rules like this, so I don't know. 45 degree angles, huh? That's the that's real. Well, I definitely think that having your taillights slightly different size is a little bit of a bullshit reason to get pulled over. (laughs) But. It was enough for Wiggum, and I actually really enjoy this scene because this is where we find out that Ruth has absolutely no intention of pulling over. This car is, in fact, stolen. It's her ex-husband's, and instead of hitting the brakes, she hits the gas. And Wiggum's excited because he's got himself an old-fashioned car chase. All he needs now is some car chase music. Sun shines, lollipops, and... Rainbow, everything, everything that's, that's wonderful, wonderful is what, what I feel when we're, we're together. together. <laughs> Great callback. It goes back to the same song that they had for Ruth earlier. And the only difference is this is actually the song that Wiggum meant to play. He, he wasn't mistaken. <laughs> they start singing along with it, doesn't he? <laughs> Both him and Homer do, actually. Yeah. It's quite great. And that is pretty much the end of Act 2. Once we get into this final act, we already talked about it a little bit. I, it's it's actually the most exciting part in terms of what's happening. This is where the most action of the episode occurs. But to Richie's point earlier, and I did not think of this until he said it, but it's something that's been weighing on me since, it's they really are limited to what they can do with the characters. Just in the, the situation they put themselves into, it really doesn't leave a lot of options. For now, 
Wiggum is actually calling in the situation on the radio. We're in pursuit of two female suspects. One is wearing a green dress, pearls, and a lot of blue hair. <laughs> blue hair. What a freak. <laughs> Homer's actually laying in the back seat, and he's once he says this, he, we can see what he's envisioning. And he's like this snake-like alien creature that has pearl antennas and a blue beard. But the best part is when Wiggum hits a bump, it jumbles the image so that it actually looks like Marge. And it's not till that moment that Homer realizes that they're chasing his wife. Ah! It's Marge! She's become a criminal because I didn't take her to the ballet! Yeah, that's exactly how Dillinger got started. Really? (laughs) That's two Dillinger things in a row. Like, we had... John Dillinger actually appear in the last episode. That's true. Part of the jury of the damned. And uh, again, John Dillinger is an American gangster from the Depression era. So he was uh, rampant in the early 30s, but his career did not last long because he died in 1934. But he was a very famous mobster for uh, the times. And apparently... Did you say mobster? Apparently he got started <laughs> when he didn't get taken to the ballet. <laughs> A tragic tale. We just want to see those bears in those cars, damn it. But the chase is on, and Marge tries to convince Ruth, let's just give up, turn yourself in. But on principle, Ruth just cannot let her ex-husband win again. She asks for Marge's support, and I love this little internal monologue we get with uh, Marge, because we can hear her brain, it says, I should say something reassuring, but not committal. (laughs) She just ends up going with the classic, "Mm." The good old Marge groan. It's good for all occasions. Ruth tells Marge that she's sorry that she got her into this, and she'll drop her off when she loses the cops. But Marge is worried that losing the cops is going to be difficult. I mean, after all, these are professional lawmen. And this is the other scene that I think competes for the best scene in the episode, in my mind. I I love this. It's Ruth just kills the lights and instantly the car goes dark and Wiggum actually says, oh my God, it just disappeared. It's a ghost car. There are ghost (laughs) cars all over these highways, you know. (laughs) Hold me. Only if you hold me. They shiver and hover to get, uh, hold each other. <laughs> they're, they're cuddling in the front seat of a cop car on the dark and possibly haunted highway, though I, I doubt that last part. <laughs> Marge is actually dropped off, as promised, at a roadside cafe, and they have a sweet goodbye, Ruth and Marge do, and I, I do love when Marge says, you know, everything up to the high-speed chase was just lovely. And Ruth tells her she's a good friend. And in the cafe, a great sequence because Marge goes, I assume she's going to call Homer. Maybe she's calling the cops and her friend. I don't really know. They seem to know where she's at. But she's trying to call home because she doesn't have a ride. She doesn't know Homer's in that car yet. Yeah, she's just trying to get get to Homer. And uh, she looks around the room as she's about to make the call. And that's when we see a series of people. uh, We get a sequence of interactions amongst people. There's a couple of ladies who look very familiar. They're sitting at a booth, and they are, in fact, drawn to resemble the characters Thelma and Louise. Uh, One of them is actually wearing a hat very similar to the one that Sigourney Weaver wears. And she says to the other one, This cross-country flight from the law would be hell if we didn't stick together. Hey, friends stick together. And then at the next booth, there's two more women sitting there holding hands, and one says... It's amazing through all this adversity that we've managed to stick together. If there is one thing decent folk do, it's stick together. And finally, a waitress is trying to separate two waffles that are stuck together, and she's complaining, I hate it when the waffles stick together. And then the cook walks up and he says, Sticking together is what good waffles do. (laughs) Did you know that, Miles? I bet you didn't know that. Hey, man, sticking together is important. I also like just in the background, there's no other sequences, but in the background at every single table, there's two ladies that are essentially holding hands or (laughs) or like clearly being there and sticking together for one another. (laughs) And the next scene is great too. Marge is clearly conflicted on the phone, but when we see outside, Ruth is getting the car filled up with gas and you hear police sirens in the background. 
literally like every car in the parking lot ditches like people flood out of the building and they all hop in their cars and get out of dodge and when ruth jumps in the car we see that marge is actually back in the passenger seat she asks her what she's doing and marge starts to give this long-winded speech about friendship but ruth knows there's no time for that so we just hear marge as uh ruth drives down the highway (laughs) <laughs> this this whole sequence here is great too actually i love that the the cop sirens end up being just kearney he's on his bicycle with a red light attached to his helmet and clearly some sort of speaker system playing a siren uh, and the owner comes out to yell at him about how you know this drives away all my customers <laughs> see you tomorrow loser so clearly this is something that happens every single day <laughs> And we get another great Wiggum scene. Carolyn Omine mentioned how Wiggum scenes just seem to grow and take over in script sometimes. And this one, he seems all of his parts just got pretty big because he just keeps coming back for more. This time he's cooking eggs on the car's engine and he actually says, hmm, engine block eggs. If we can keep these down, we'll be sitting pretty. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> which they're not even opened up yet. So that's, it's possible to keep that down, I guess. <laughs> And Ruth and Marge actually end up driving right by them, and and Homer yells, That's them! Shh! I can't hear the eggs! (laughs) (laughs) So, we're back at the Simpsons homes another time. This time we see the Simpsons kids wake up on the couch, and Bart notices it's actually morning, and Mom and Dad still aren't back, but Lisa reassures them everything's fine. I mean, Mr. Hutz is still here to take care of us. (laughs) But Lionel... Lionel Hutz wakes up with a knife and he starts swinging it before screaming, don't touch my stuff. (laughs) Don't touch my stuff. Hey, this isn't the (laughs) YMCA. I love that. Lionel Hutz is so good. I mean, again, every time (laughs) Phil Hartman's in an episode, it's great. But this there is some really great Lionel Hutz in this episode. To me, it's it's interesting that a lot of times and it's because I guess they know they're going to use him in the in the episode already so they use him multiple times but it seems like it's all or none like it's either there's no phil hartman in the episode or like at least two of his characters are in the episode every time well i think it's i think it's once they start to write his characters into the show they just want to it's so funny they just want to fill it out as much as possible i think they're like he's he's gonna be here already so yeah might as well use him yeah he's really fucking good yeah So, meanwhile, Wiggum is still having trouble calling in this pursuit on the radio. This time, he's able to to stay with the car. After all, it's daylight, so they can't be so sneaky by just turning off their lights. (laughs) But he's still struggling to describe where his exact location is. Oh, uh, I'm uh, I'm on a road. Uh, Appears to be asphalt. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Shrubs. Trees. I am directly under the Earth's sun now. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's being as accurate as he possibly can. Well, and somehow it fucking works. That's the impressive <laughs> part. Because in the next sequence, we see Kent Brockman reporting on the Simpsons television set that they have identified the suspects. And not only do they have a news copter on the scene, there's like at least eight or ten police cars now on pursuit or in pursuit of Marge and Ruth. Lisa's actually proud of her mom, and Bart is to some extent, at first he's like, cool, but then Lisa's really proud. She says, I knew mom would someday violently rise up and cast off the shackles of our male oppressors. Meh, shut your trap. (laughs) Bart being a male oppressor. It's a, again, really Voiced by a woman. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. (laughs) And I also really, really love Kent Brockman here, because he says, at the risk of editorializing, these women are guilty and must be dealt with in a harsh and brutal fashion. Otherwise, their behavior could incite other women, causing anarchy of biblical proportion. (laughs) So we're basically saying, oh, the opening of Pandora's box? (laughs) The look on Bart and Lisa's face is great here, too, because they're just clearly in shock. And when it goes back to the TV screen, Kent Brockman screams out, It's in Revelations, people! (laughs) And we get this great technical difficulty sign where a cuckoo clock or a cuckoo bird is like popped out of Kent Brockman's forehead and it says technical difficulties. What I like about this episode, man, is it's like cleverly a feminist episode without like shoving it again, being clever about not shoving it down your throat or in your face. And this is again in 1993. 
And it's stuff that, like, again, is, uh, we talk about this every week. It's something you, you understand a little bit as a kid, but you don't quite get it till now. And, like, it's awesome that The Simpsons was doing stuff like this way back in the early 90s. Way ahead of its time in a lot of ways, but also a relic of the times at hand because it, it is... I think The Simpsons is a representation of the 90s at this time in, in so many ways, what's going on in the world. And uh, I, I agree with you. I love the the feminist aspect of this episode. I think it brings some good points. I think there's... there's you could play it today and it, it would it this works would be an important episode today. For what's happening in, in today's world. I completely agree. That's kind of sad, though, when you think about that, that it's from 93 to now, it's it's still pretty much spot on. Yeah, they they really nailed it with this episode, and again, also not just the the feeling of the times, but also the way that they do so while also parodying a very popular movie of the time. So they're able to, and to be fair, feminism is definitely a theme in the movie Thelma and Louise for certain. It's about women right. uprising against their male oppressors in a lot of ways. That's just so well adapted to a cartoon show where it comes off as still funny without being preachy, but while also making really good points. Well struck again, sir. Two good blows. <laughs> Back on the road, Marge and Ruth are now only two miles from the state line, which apparently counts as safe haven in this instance. Uh, so they're driving into the sunset, but then they actually see coming over the hill, like, they claim it must be every cop in Springfield. It must be every cop in North Haverville and Ogdenville and all of the places. Ice Creamville. Because there's like a ton of cops coming over this, this hill right now. I think it's like literally like 40 cop cars. And how are they all coming from that one direction? Yeah, because keep in mind, there's already Springfield police from behind them as well. So clearly they're calling yeah. in support from the outside outside cities. Uh, apparently there's Border Patrol in Springfield. <laughs> and I also, once again, love there's a little bit of a, a role reversal here because Ruth has been the driving force of the rebellion at this point, And Marge has been the reasonable friend that Ruth never had growing up. But at this point, Ruth is actually broken. She realizes there's just no way for a single mother to win in this man's world. But Marge refuses to hear it. She says that's a bunch of hooey. And she grabs the wheel and steers them into the desert. I love that, though, because right afterwards, she actually apologizes. is like, oh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have just done that. I should have asked first. <laughs> <laughs> but I like how that simple little thing, and all of a sudden, Ruth's like, no, you did it, Marge. We're going to make it. Yeah. Based on what? <laughs> In that moment, they feel like they've they've done something. But as we can see, all they've done is steered themselves right into the grand chasm, which I'm not going to make a joke about women and directions here. But <laughs> Homer <laughs> thinks that it's all his fault. He actually grabs the megaphone and starts trying to reason with Marge. I'm sorry I haven't been a better husband. I'm sorry about the time I tried to make gravy in the bathtub. And I'm sorry I used your wedding dress to wax the car. Let's just say I'm sorry about our whole marriage up to this point. But please, <laughs> please do not drive into that chasm. Chasm? <laughs> and they hit the brakes and come to a dead stop right on the edge of the chasm. At least Marge and Ruth do. Wiggum and Homer go flying right off the end of that son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and just like the movie, this episode comes to an end with the car suspended in midair, and then the screen fades to white, and we're left wondering what will happen from here. And then we'll immediately get an answer, because it's <laughs> The Simpsons. But we need that Simpsons reset, so they do give us a quick answer, and it's in yet another great joke. Uh, the show continues further than the movie did. It turns out that that chasm was being used as a landfill. Homer and Wiggum were saved by a big, heaping, gross pile of garbage. Of shot. <laughs> I mean, that other word. <laughs> Wiggum. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I love Wiggum's line here. Ha! And to think those idiot environmentalists were protesting this landfill. Solid waste. I could kiss you. Mwah! Uh, mwah, uh, mwah. Mm, I think this is pizza. <laughs> oh, go so gross. Uh, this is actually this joke was created because at the time it was actually a a common practice to use 
these Grand Canyons, not actually the Grand Canyon, but these giant canyons across the United States, they would actually use as landfills. So this was a little jab for the environmentalists at the environmentalists, kind of in the same way I think (laughs) that we would love to be made fun of on The Simpsons. I think this was with the same intention, where it was a joke kind of at their expense, but also at the same time raises awareness. Can we start the hashtag now? I know, I know we have Mr. Most, Day, Mr. Most Days Off for Prez. Can we start like a best darn diddly for Simpsons hashtag maybe <laughs> to get us to, to have the writers and producers know that we need to be on the show? Say something terrible about us? <laughs> BDD for Simps. <laughs> yeah, this is getting complicated. I feel like that's <laughs> going to pull up some weird, weird Google results. Rare. <laughs> There's one more sequence on this episode to wrap everything up. It's actually a Dragnet parody, just like they used to end the show Dragnet, where you'd see what happens to the criminals during that episode. Sometimes they, you know, were found innocent. Sometimes they were found guilty. Sometimes they were sentenced. Sometimes they were fined. Whatever the case might be, we learned that Ruth's charges were actually dismissed and her ex-husband was forced to pay up on all of his back child support. Which was only four months. I love that the narrator points out that Mr. Powers blamed his lawyer, one Lionel Hutz, for the loss. <laughs> which we also <laughs> learn about Lionel Hutz, a.k.a. He looks so sad, too, just like the end of a Dragnet episode. <laughs> yeah. A.k.a. Miguel Sanchez, a.k.a. Dr. Nulin Van Falk. He was paid $8 for his 32 hours of babysitting. He was glad to get it. <laughs> Marge was charged with destruction of antique cans. She was forced to pay 50 cents for the cans and $2,000 in punitive damages and mental anguish. (laughs) That's ridiculous, but I do love the animation here with Marge. And I have to point out another fun fact from the commentary. David Merkin said that the network had a big, big problem with Marge smoking. And in fact, They kept saying that he had to remove it, had to remove it. So when he finally turned in additional animation, instead of removing it, he just had her take a few more drags on the cigarette. (laughs) I love when they do that shit. Uh, When they fight the power. (laughs) Yep. But yeah, it was a big anti-smoking thing and they couldn't have it seen. It's like she's a criminal at this point. She's clearly not a role model. Uh, though Marge is obviously a role model, she's great. But don't smoke, kids. Yeah, but the character that she's playing at the in that little end sequence is supposed it to makes be it like so much a funnier. bad person. Yeah, yeah, it makes it hilarious, and and all of the looks you pointed out. Lionel it's like Hutt's adding the mariachis great. to evil Homer's hands. Exactly, like it makes it so it exaggerates it so much more. It's the garnish, but you need it. Whatever the maracas, not mariachis. Yeah, <laughs> not mariachis that would be weird. Game. Yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, That's where your tattoo should be. <laughs> and I also do like. Uh, lastly, we see Homer, who is being remanded back to the army for extensive testing. Woohoo! <laughs> Fun fact on this last sequence: they actually got George Thurman, who is the actor who did the actual voice at the end sequence on Dragnet, to do this Simpson sequence. And, of course, Alf Clauston does an amazing rendition of The Simpsons theme in the out credits to the Dragnet style. Yeah, that voice makes it so much better at the end, too. It's absolutely perfect because it's the exact same voice, which is, which is fantastic. Yeah. And that does hit The Simpsons reset, puts everything back in order for next week, and, of course, brings us to the end of the episode. Richie, was there anything else that you or that book of yours want to say about Marge on the Lamb? My book, The Simpsons, A Complete Guide to Our Favorite Family, I wanted to point out that one of the highway signs they saw while this chase scene was about to start said, Entering Badlands, High Speed Chases, Use Diamond Lane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I like that. It's uh, Again, on a personal note, it's it's one of those episodes that I'm kind of stilted towards before watching it because, again, as a kid, it's all Homer and Bart, and we go over this every time there's a Marge Lisa episode. But this episode had so many more f- iconic, funny moments that I remember from the series that I real that I didn't realize were from this episode. So I'm really glad that a lot of the Marge episodes are getting this. And this was actually a really great episode, I feel, up until the chase. And again, I'm gonna go back with it. It's exciting, like you say, but it's just I, I feel like they were losing a lot of the momentum by having the chase scene. And I think that's why they have the break in the chase scene where they go to the diner, because that gives them a chance to stop that for a second and actually have a little bit more dialogue and like that whole sticking together part was hilarious but I, that's I just, what good friends do i feel like a lot of the third act was was kind of sped up even though it was a longer episode than what we typically <laughs> used to up. so 
Yeah, yeah, you said <laughs> did there. That was beautiful, man. That was beautiful. But yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, it's still, it was still, again, we're in the golden age of The Simpsons, so it was still a very good episode. I just, I wish there, I guess, was a little bit more to see, like, Pamela Reed interacting with, like, Homer and Bart and all that would have been funny, I think. Yeah, I think that they could have used her a little bit more, and they even said that themselves in the commentary that they, they regret not using her more. Uh, as far as the episode goes, I will say that definitely comparing it now to when I was a kid, there are far, far more layers to this episode than I originally realized, and I do really enjoy the episode. Disappointing on the research aspect, just for the podcast particularly, but that's kind of a weird complaint, I realize. It's a, a really, really unique perspective to have to worry about uh, appealing to in terms of the creators of the show. <laughs> but one last thing I do want to say, just to make sure we got it across well enough, because I really thought this was a major part of the episode that was done very subtly but also was kind of the overlying point between Homer and Marge's story. Uh, again, Marge, the entire episode, was frustrated with Homer, and Ruth kept saying over and over again just how lucky she was, and it wasn't till that megaphone sequence where Marge actually realized just how lucky she was, uh, and unfortunately that did end up with them flying into a trash heap because that's how long it took for her to realize. But I just thought that... that interaction where marge was being told over and over again and not really seeing the big picture but then by the end of the episode even marge who is a much smarter character than homer can still have a perspective change and, and learn something by the epi- by the end of the episode so uh, a lot of fun on that level but well it's a lot of things where when you're told something from somebody on the outside it, you're like yeah, yeah yeah whatever but then when you actually are going through it yourself you're paying so much more attention Absolutely, yeah. But that will do it for this week's Best Darn Diddly Review Show. Richie, where can they find you online? You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at the Wiz underscore kid23. Also, while you're on Twitter, go ahead and give our show a follow as well. That's at Best Darn Diddly. That's D-I-D-D-L-Y. And that also works on Instagram as well. As for me, I am at Mr. Most Days Off. That works pretty much everywhere. Definitely please subscribe to my YouTube channel and check out the new companion series of this show, Behind the Diddly. It's just a short video. Every Friday is the plan right now. A few minutes talking about what is going on since we do record these so far ahead of time. A little way to stay in touch with each other in the moment. So please check that out and do me a favor and subscribe to that. Other than that, as always, we just want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Best Darn Daily Review Show. We really appreciate you listening and joining us each week on this journey through the Simpsons series. The Wiz Kid and I will be back with you next week to review the episode, Bart's Inner Child. Bidely idly. <laughs> Until next time, be cromulent to each other. Hi, I'm Drew. I'm Nate. And I'm Tanner. And we are the hosts of Headline Heroes. Every week we take a bizarre, out there article. Germans build underground pipeline for beer. An attempt to create a superhero or villain. The obvious one is that they have a giant robot that runs off of beer. Along the way we discuss powers, design a costume, and of course, struggle with a name. Graham Graham Sam Sam? No, no. Graham <laughs> Graham Sam Sam? No! And inevitably we get off subject and talk about the really important stuff. I did go to Bill Engvall's website and i just want to tell you a couple of things i'm seeing here. please do i wish you would but we always arrive with the super creation we are proud of join headline heroes every tuesday as we try to make reality a little more super